When I arrived at Watches and Wonders a while ago, I went straight to the Bremont Showcase. I looked at the watches, I thought, okay, and then I left. Only three hours later did I come to the conclusion that I needed to spend some more time on Bremont. So many people had asked me what I thought about Bremont's new direction, so I dragged myself back with the intention to give them a decent amount of time and not just default to my initial meh reaction. Everybody seemingly has an opinion about Bremont, the dude with the quirky marketing guy glasses at their head, and their new direction. This took me some time. These are my thoughts. Bremont has been around since 2002. They were founded in England, and in a nutshell, they are primarily known as luxury watchmakers with a lean towards military, industry, and aviation. You can read up on the founders online. From 2002 till today, they succeeded in growing Bremont to a revenue of over 20 million pounds per year. That's relatively impressive considering Christopher Ward are doing maybe 20 million pounds per year as well. But they've had a problem. They haven't made a profit in the last 10 years. Bremont have quite literally been in a mode of spending money to make money. This is a company that invested in flagship boutiques, high stress materials and watch testing to aviation standards and also in-house movements. They also built a massively good looking headquarters that likely cost quite a bit. But no matter who's funding you, at some point somebody wants a return on their investment and with 10 years of a big fat zilch, something had to happen. Bremont brought in Davide Serrato, an industry insider with a history from Tudor, HYT and Panerai to make Bremont profitable. What have they done? Simply put, David and company have done two things. They defined three new distinct categories of watches, land, sea and air, with the corresponding Terra Nova, Supermarine and Altitude model lines. The watches have a new aesthetic with a new logo and the whole shebang. Second thing they did was a new price point. Where Bremont have historically been solidly in the luxury segment with watches like the Supernova that cost $9,000, these new Bremont watches start at around $2,800 for an entry Terranova and about three, three and a half thousand USD for an entry Supermarine. That's an entirely different price point. So basically, they largely ditched the British military army aviation branding and replaced it with a more outdoor lifestyle forward branding at a price point which is more focused on value rather than luxury. A lot of loyal Bremont fans loved the old branding, which was incredibly consistent and powerful. I've never really cared that much about Bremont watches, but I definitely knew what they stood for. They were military, they were solid, they were uncompromising, and a lot of their models reflected that. My guess is there were two key conversations about the rebranding. I think one, they needed to distance themselves from the semi-luxury associations that the old Bremont brand was associated with. Second, I think they made a calculation that globally a more outdoor lifestyle focused branding would be more compelling than some semi-colonial empire centric English branding. I know if you are English, that will feel a little bit unpleasant to hear. And it's not necessarily my personal conclusion, but I think those were the conversations they were having. Less English, more lifestyle. How did they end up on these categories of air, land and sea? The cynic in me says management consultants, generic marketing insight and landing on the suggestion everybody in the room could kind of compromise to agree on. This is the open AI answer to a broadly appealing branding strategy. Is it a wise move? I generally try to be balanced and not pass judgment too quickly, but my gut reaction to the new branding direction is frustration. I respect companies that have a cohesive branding and a watch lineup with a coherent and again, a cohesive narrative. So many brands are all over the place. But when marketing is at its worst, it's cookie cutter, it's boring, and it's completely uninspired. From an advertising perspective, I'm always reminded of the ads of truck sales where apparently you have to wear a Stetson and ride a horse and have a blade of corn or grass between your teeth while looking over the prairie. There's nothing wrong with that, mind you, but it's just so cliche in a commercial. And that was my core reaction to Bremont's new direction. Cliche. Also, the Terra Nova is the Hamilton Khaki Field, the Supermarine is the Hamilton Khaki Navy, and the Altitude is the Hamilton Khaki Air. Breitling did so much better with their squads. Bremont just feels derivative and almost plagiarized. Setting aside my initial frustration, the idea of having a cohesive and clear narrative makes sense. Communicating clearly to your target audience makes sense. The Terra Nova goes outdoors. There's a market for outdoor watches. The supermarines are divers. Divers are perennially popular, so that makes sense. 
Aviation is usually popular and potentially speaks to a slightly more dressy lifestyle. It's not a bad idea and it's not necessarily going to be a driver of failure, but it is a little generic. It is objectively derivative, but Breitling has proven that that can work. So maybe Bremont will as well. I think my key point is that just because it's dull doesn't necessarily mean it's going to definitively lead to failure. Give it a year or two and everybody will have forgotten about Bremont's old pricing. New price point will become the norm. New customers will come and old customers will leave. Bremont is clearly fine with that. Pricing though is a potential big problem. The logic Bremont is applying is that instead of spending tons on luxury branding, luxury components, luxury in-house movements that sell in smaller numbers, they can sell more watches at a lower price and although not skimping on components, they are still overall lowering cost levels and thereby potentially raising profit margins. It makes intuitive business sense, but, and I often have a however, their entry turnover 38 is $2,850. You get, in fairness, a fairly modified Sedita movement, but it's still a Sedita movement with 38 hours of power reserve. You get a leather strap, you get 100 meters of water resistance, and you get a well-finished case out of 904L steel. But then you get the Tudor Ranger, about $3,000. Full steel bracelet, T-foot clasp, 70 hours of built-in COSC certified movement. Christopher Ward has a C65 Dune for 1,200. It's a Salita SW200, 38 hours of power reserve. It's not COSC certified, but it's more than half the price. On what planet is the Terra Nova a competitive price? It's either a very expensive Christopher Ward or a relatively underspecced Tudor. Let's try that again. Supermarine date, 300 meters of water resistance, $3,650, 50 hours of power reserve. Or you could get yourself a Tudor Black Bay 41 millimeter, METAS approved, chronometer certified, 70 hours of power reserve, T-fit clasp, Jubilee bracelet. Or you can go cheaper and get a Longines Hydro Conquest for $2,775 with 72 hours of power reserve. Same question, on what planet is the Bremont competitive? Is it a bad watch? No. Is it badly specced? No, but it's at best on par with comparable offers. And in my opinion, it's too expensive compared to what you can get from a Tudor, from Formex, from Christopher Ward, from Longines, or a million others. In some ways, I'd even say it could be perceived as a little bit arrogant that a brand that can't figure out how to make money in the luxury watch space would fare better in the hyper competitive, lower margin mid space that they're now aiming for. Trading Rolex or Omega as competitors out with Tudor and Longines is not exactly going to make things easier. This is a massively competitive space. And if it's value they're going for, they potentially lose. If it's quality they're going for, they potentially lose with those current offerings. The simple value proposition for a more expensive than a Christopher Ward, but not as good as a Tudor, is just not good. And this is where we get to the watches. I'll start with the Terra Nova and the Supermarines, but I'll get to the altitude as well. The Terra Nova and the Supermarines both look a lot better in reality than online. The Terra Novas don't photograph well on flat photos. In real life, it's much better, but it's still irrelevant because the concern I have with these watches is more conceptual than aesthetic. Well, I'll start by picking apart the Supermarine. Recently, I did a video about dive watches and what made a good dive watch. I have this one dimension which addresses whether you have a conventional or a more esoteric or unique design. So a Doxa is unique, a Willard is unique, and an SPB 453, a Submariner, a Margin Ocean King, and a Tudor Black Bay 31, they are all conventional. They're simple, they're middle of the road, they are the definition of broadly appealing. They all have this design that most people will find appealing. Apart from the bracelet on the Supermarine, which is a little bit different, the rest of the Supermarine is at best unremarkable. Unremarkable will sell a lot. People like broadly appealing designs that fit into any wardrobe, but this is a rebrand of Bremont, and that's a key thing to take note of. When Davide was at Tudor and was part of the team that launched the Black Bay, they brought something new to the table. At the time, the Black Bay relaunched Fotina, vintage and retro style divers. The Black Bay brought something new to the table. I've got trouble seeing what the Supermarine brings to the table at all. It comes across as just another generic dive watch, and that's not the reaction you want for a new line. And then you have the Terra Nova. It's not the same problem as the Supermarine at all. 
we have fully loomed huge numerals like a Hamilton khaki field. We have a compass bezel like a Hamilton khaki expedition. And then we have what most of all reminds me of a Breitling Chronomat-esque bracelet. Add to that that we have fonts that like Spinal Tap are dialed up to 11 and throw in a tonneau case Panerai style. There's a lot going on and this isn't a great first iteration. The AP code 1159 was not good in its first iteration either, but it had potential. The 1908 from Rolex I feel is also not spot on yet, but it has potential. I honestly think right now this design has potential to be good, but this is not a middle of the road design like the Supermarine. This is not broadly appealing at all. People don't want weird case shapes. The mass consumer doesn't want esoteric, special or unusual. They want something easily stylable. I'm a big fan of something like the Longines Magitech, but that's never going to be a big seller for Longines. So the Supermarine delivers yet another unremarkable generic dive watch. And on the other hand, the Terra Nova is anything but mainstream. It's appealing to a very niche audience with its design choices. Bremont have chosen two completely different lanes for these two products. My other question mark is that I just generally wonder whether there is a market with a willingness to pay three, four or five thousand dollars for a flagship field watch. Consider for a moment how many field watches that are in this price range. There aren't a lot. The Hamiltons sell at closer to one thousand dollars. Formex, Baltic, Vice, all are way cheaper. In this range where the Terra Nova lies, the Tudor Ranger is not quite alone, but it's close to. But more importantly, whether it's the Ranger or a Railmaster, close to none of those are at the center of what the brand offers. The Ranger, the Railmaster, the Explorer from Rolex are more niche offerings on the fringes of the brand's offerings. With Bremont, it's front and center at three times the price of Hamilton. When close to no manufacturer puts their field watch as the load bearing component of their entire brand strategy for watches over $3,000, then you have to ask yourself, how big is the market really? Maybe it is the next big thing and I'm not seeing it, but I'm not sure that many people in this segment want this expensive a field watch. I think it potentially runs very counter to what a field watch is. This kind of pricing for a flagship model seems off. And finally, the altitudes. Where's the design language that connects the Terra Nova, the Supermarine and the altitude? I don't see the shared design language in these three Bremont product lines. Currently, the altitudes are an afterthought or a remnant of Bremont's past. The people that say these watches are bad or a disaster are likely wrong. They have potential, but they are right now all over the place and I don't see them bringing something new and compelling to the market or bringing in a new mainstream customer. That's probably the biggest problem. <sighs> Is this going to end Bremont like the doomsayers are predicting? Not necessarily, and I think that's key. I do feel that the implementation of land, sea and air is incredibly generic, completely unoriginal and just generally bland. But I do see both land and sea speaking to some customers. It could work. Outdoors is big. Campers, hikers, runners, outdoorsy people. It's not a completely bananas play, despite it being so incredibly bland. Especially because people will buy watches from a bland company if they like the product. The positioning as a premium value based product is not convincing for me, but I have a reasonable understanding of what's under the hood. And it's not so egregious that a regular consumer might not think it's a ballpark reasonable price. Maybe they'll think it's a little bit better quality than a Christopher Ward. Maybe they'll feel it's better value than a Ranger. But no matter what, they are up against a very different set of competitors. They are probably also going to have an even more difficult time convincing customers to part with their money than they had with having luxury customers part with their money. But it could happen because people will buy products that aren't necessarily technically the best if they like the product, which lands me at the watches. They're not terrible, but they're not special or good. They are at worst a bit bland like the Supermarine and at best they have too much going on and are trying too hard to be unique. But in both cases, it's fixable. They have a starting point now from where they can get consumer feedback and adjust. Based on the reaction so far, they did not steal the thunder like the Black Bay once did. The market seems to have done what I did. They looked at the watches and then they quietly just kind of moved on. That's not a good sign. 
The biggest thing though is that the old Bremont is clearly dead and gone. My gut feeling, which is completely unsentimental, is that it's okay for a company that just wants to be successful. But it is a bit sad because even though Bremont was never really a watch company that resonated with me, I could still appreciate how they built an incredibly solid but unprofitable fan base with a hugely convincing narrative. They had a really cool story. Unprofitable, but cool. Now, right now, Bremont is just one more brand in a sea of forgettable brands. Forget the branding for a moment. Forget your knowledge about Salita movements and material choices. You buy a watch that you think looks good. And Bremont, I think, got lost in the rebranding and delivered something unremarkable. It's fixable, but with 10 years of losses, they and Davide Serrato with the funny glasses are definitely under pressure. That's what I think. You don't have to agree with me. Perhaps you see it in a different way, but hopefully I've argued my case reasonably well. Let me know what you think in the comments. What's next for Bremont? Like, subscribe. Cheers.